Hey everyone, I'm here with Kristen Weitzel. I'm so excited to have you on the Unlock the Sugar Shackles podcast. Welcome. Thank you. I'm happy to be here and unlock sugar shackles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. With some different modalities, different things. We're not going to be talking as much about food today, but we're going to be talking about other things that can help with blood sugar regulation, but also overall health, right? And so we know that our metabolic health, our blood sugar is connected to so many so many things in our life and so many things in our environment. And so we can use different hacks and strategies to start to improve our overall health and our metabolic health. So we're going to dive into some of those fun things today. So Kristen, tell us a little bit about your story of how you got came to be in this space and do what you do. Yeah. Uh, the story, yeah, I'm going to give you the abbreviated version. I talk about it a lot. And so there's so much other fun stuff we can talk about other than my story. But I am, I grew up a dancer. And I think the, the catalyst for everything that I'm doing started in this process of I started dancing when I was five ballet. And I had this vision when I was a very young girl of like, hey, maybe I could be a prima ballerina. Um, that vision ended later on with like me getting a very strong shapely physique in the way that back in those days you did not you couldn't have like a D chest and like a big old booty as a ballerina so like that sort of that hampered a bit of those plans but in the midst of all this what I noticed was a lot of um what we would call nowadays body dysmorphia and um, challenges with disordered eating. And I was just really into food and liked food and, and also wanted to be able to stay fit in a way, you know, prepubescently. I was like super into food, but also knew that if I ate so much food, then I might get a little heavy or I might be, you know, in a, in a uh, let's just say a deconditioned state physically. And I was dancing. And so I was burning calories and I wasn't really like obsessing about my diet, but I was wondering and trying to figure out the path forward all the way through my like 18, 19 years old of like, how can I eat in a way that tastes good, that is like healthy, quote unquote, without feeling restricted and actually keep a figure that I was proud of or a figure that I could dance in or the energy. Because what I noticed is if I under ate a lot, I would such such low energy and like didn't feel good. And so there was just this really interesting balance that, um, was like, I think the platform that food was the platform for me, which is what's interesting. I don't talk about at food as much except with my one-on-one -on -one clients where I'm doing like uh, nutrition specialization. But the food piece led to the reading a book by Younger called Clean, which is a bit about um, one meal a day plus some like, like blender meals, meaning like liquefying some meals. It's a, again, not a long-term program. It was a short-term program that was an energy hack that was sort of in the vein of paleo, but wasn't called that. And after 30 days of doing that, I just felt like I had a thousand times more energy. My whole life and, and the way I felt every morning when I woke up had shifted. My energy for fitness was, I was more motivated. And I just thought there's something really big here. And so I started leaning into like food and find, finding ways to explore fitness that that I guess at this point wasn't called biohacking yet, but became that. So then I went and got a thousand certifications, all of I could find around like, um, you know, group fitness classes and, and being a nutritionist and just digging into anything I could, finding Mark Sisson, who was the godfather of paleo um, off the backs of Gundry, who was doing a lot of that work. And then um, all, these, all these like super nerdy Born men fitting. came before, yeah. And then, um, and then Asprey, you know, was like coined the term biohacking and, and so on and so forth. And then just continued to find the mentors that really fit well with me and progression across fitness and across nutrition and across the biohacking platform. So. It's been like a long and winding road. I like to say that I'm a really good aggregator of data. So taking lots of people's research and nerdisms and, you know, 40 plus years of studies and trying to distill it down and actually then apply it with the, the females. I predominantly work with females, but men and women, the females that I work with. So it's been an interesting ride for sure. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's really interesting and definitely different than a lot of the guests we've had on the podcast. So what are some of these hacks? Like, what do you specialize in doing and what really lights you up with the work that you're doing? I think what really is lighting me up now most is this, this sense of sort of mindset approach and 
what I want to call this like anti-shame platform, which is Ooh. I I really see over the long haul, like let's let's straightforwardly women will come to me and say either they have a contextual, I work with a couple of professional athletes, I work with plenty of people across, I call everyone athletes, so plenty, plenty of people across conditioned states and um, all over the world. And what I see is that people will come to me with a specific desire. They want to be able to play with their kids. They want to get better sleep, more rest. They want to be able to do training that's going to give them a certain physique. They have a contextual contest or fight or race or something that's coming up. Or they, a lot of them will come to me and say, I just came out of two and a half years of this whole thing and I'm stressed, depressed and overweight. And I always like to tell them first, do not overweight. You've got too much body fat. And that may be true, but I don't like to talk about weight because weight is a misnomer. That term includes everything, bone, muscle, fat, tenement, tendons, ligaments, joints, you know, all of that. So we don't want to lose most of that. But typically women are looking to lose if they're losing, looking to lose quote unquote weight is body fat. And the long and the short of it is that on most of those journeys, a lot of them build back to this one issue, which is. Um, not having radical self-love and not having uh, the ability to look at themselves in the mirror every morning and see their value or their worth. And that's what I mean by the anti-shame dynamic is like I, or the anti-shame shame platform. Because for me, the work is important around blood sugar and fitness and getting outdoors and all of these biohacks. But if we don't continue to do this like self-inquiry work around what we think of ourselves when we look in the mirror, what we think of ourselves when we interact with our romantic partner or our friends or relatives, family or people in the world. If we don't get that nailed down and that, that self-love or self-worth component, it continues to come up and bubble up and then, and then become a roadblock and all these other things we wanna do. And so I'm feeling that hard. I'm feeling that with um, young women I'm working with who are dealing with societal pressure and all of this, like still the media, still all the shit that's out there. And then I'm dealing with that with women who are like perimenopausal, menopausal, because they're starting to shift hormonally and say, oh, maybe this is like, I guess I'm not valuable anymore, which is so fucked up. Uh, pardon my French, but not. I like to sometimes, you know, I, I emphasize what's going on because people are feeling these, these strifes and it's not, I don't, I don't love it. I, there's any woman that's listening to this podcast right now and any man for that matter, but especially with women, because we're a bit more sensitive in our neural makeup and our neurochemistry, you have so much value to bring to the world. You, you're listening to Danielle's podcast. She's a phenomenal powerhouse female. She's like educating so many people on ways to live more evenly and healthfully in the long run. And if you're listening to this podcast and you're a woman right now driving in your car, walking down the street, whatever it might be, you have gifts and you have to share them. It is my requirement for you to take the many risks of putting yourself out there to continue to share your gifts and recognize and step into your beauty and your power. And that is not aesthetic, that is internal. And that is, you know, call it goddess energy if you wanna be woo or call it like badass female if you wanna be scientific. But that's, that's I know that's long-winded, but that's really where it's really striking a chord with me lately. Yeah, I mean, your words are bringing up so much emotion. Like I could almost start crying if I were on <laughs> a coaching call, I probably would because that's <laughs> always my space. But I'm sort of coming into some similar things in my coaching experience as well in that people, you know, women especially, because most people I work with are women, they have this, like you said, it's from society, from you know, things in the media, where else do you feel like the messaging is going wrong and women are internalizing it? Or why do you think we're, there's so many women today that have this deflated sense of self-worth or like putting themselves last? It's like, well, I'm a mom and I have to do this first for my kids. And so, you know, I see a lot of women who take my program and they're like, the kids have finally moved out. And so it's finally me time. And I'm like, I love that you're doing this for yourself, but it's interesting that a lot of women are waiting and putting themselves on the back burner, even though we know that you can't pour from an empty cup. So what's your take on that? Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm pretty aligned with you and I, I, I'm very aligned with you, but it's, it's, it's really interesting to see this place and time and space we are in the world. And I think a lot of what is, if you want to call the silver lining out of coming out of this global pandemic is, is that maybe our people are starting to do a bit more self-inquiry and understand that even if time is a construct that we have a limited time and this iteration of life, 
And with females, there's, you know, I'd like to invite women to explore the possibility that they can take care of themselves right now and make space, like make a date with themselves every day. I have a half an hour in my schedule every day and I call it higher self meeting. <laughs> I, I just would like to invite, call it what you want, right? And then do I make it every single day perfectly? No, sometimes do I take a nap during that time? Hell yeah. Like, but it's for my higher self. It's for my self care. It's for my ability to stretch for other people. It's the, the harder we work, the more we want to heal and love the planet. And as a coach, you may relate to this, the harder, and let's stop using the word hard, the more challenging it can be to create and hold and fix to that space you create for your own self-care. And so uh, what I notice strongly is in the times that I am doing the simple consistencies of self-care or higher self-meeting or blocking a date with myself out every day, whether that be morning routine, evening routine, what have you, and sticking to it is the most important date that I have. The more I do that frequently and consistently, the better I show up for my clients, my friends, my lover, everyone. And that is so, if we wait 40 years, and I see it, if we wait 40 years and we serve everyone else, the amount of time it takes to course correct a lot of either the dis-ease or the stress or the capacity around what we're able to do or the knowledge of who we really are and what we really want, it takes so much longer and it's at a strong detriment because you're at a place in your life where um, things move a tiny bit slower when you're trying to move the needle than when you were like 16 or 25, et cetera. And so I just, I, I urge anyone to, to do the thing that you're talking about, which is we say this all the time. You can't fill other people's cup with your, when yours is empty. And it's like, it's sort of lost its meaning. And the reality is it doesn't have to be I want my, my daily morning routine, evening routine. I want four hours a day that I can just like do all the things and biohacks. It's not real. That's not real. Let's be clear. But if you, if it's a 20 minute meditation and that's all you can win quite often with a client, my clients, I will give them like a buffet menu, like a down regulation menu. And it's like, Hey, choose two. Some of them, one of them is like a five minute breathing technique. So like, you don't get to just do that. And then that's it. You have to excel and be a leveled up version of your, you know, female, iteration on the planet or the person that you are. And so I say, choose two, choose three, you know, what can you get done on the weekend, incorporate and involve your family, your partner, your, if you do breath work with your lover, while you guys are in bed, having sex, you can have a wildly heightened orgasm. So get after that self-care ladies or men or whatever, right. Or everybody who's listening. And so I think it's like, if you're happy, how do you feel and walk around the world and how do you serve others? When I'm pissed, I'm not a great woman checking out at the grocery store, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. This is so important. Everything you just said is so important. And I think it's such a good message that doesn't get spoken about a lot. Like we talk about all the, you know, the fun, fancy biohacks and things. And we're going to talk about those, which are, you know, super exciting and fun, like ice baths and red light. And, but taking time for yourself when it feels hard, when there's a really long to-do list. And this is something that for me, it's something that falls by the wayside easily because I can continue to prioritize other people like answering messages on Instagram and getting back to my emails and clearing my inbox and responding to all these people. I find that that can easily be done before I wanna sit in stillness. And so that's where I, that's where my work is. And I see how it shows up because I was talking the other day that I was getting triggered because, you know, people will send me things, not everybody, um, but some people will send me like their whole health history and all these numbers, all this data. And it's, I say, you know, I put out all this information and, you know, people are expecting that I, you know, do this work for them without realizing how much time it takes. And I'm like, that's not on them. That's me getting triggered because I'm not honoring my own boundaries. That has nothing to do with anyone else. There's always going to be, there's people out there struggling. They see me when they see me knowing things and they're asking for help. You know, yeah. it's, it, it's not about them. That's about my boundary. And me stepping over, like pushing down my boundaries constantly. So 
the idea of having those 20 minutes at any time in the day that what did, what do you call it? Your higher self well, down. I like a, a higher self meeting or like higher a down regulation menu. And like in order yeah. to put a higher self meeting in my calendar, I had yeah. to have someone come in my life who was in a coaching relationship, who was mentoring me, suggesting it. And the important point there is I'm a coach. I'm a banging coach. You're an amazing coach. And we still all, every one of us on this planet can find someone who's in a different space on a specific path, even if they're just five steps ahead and they're going to make a strong recommendation. And typically that's a coaching relationship. If my, you know, my, you know, my partner, he's in the biohacking space. And if he tells me something to do, I'm always like, ABC, always be coaching. He's always coaching me and I'm never listening to it. So it has to be someone in really, it's not that I don't respect and trust him. And I do listen sometimes, but I mean, it's like, I, you need to have someone with like a, a, some authority and some like, maybe like handholding or accountability that really can help you like take the big steps, right? The great leap to the next place. So you can avoid all the weird little pitfalls in the middle. And so the higher self meeting is great. Putting together a down regulation menu of things you like. And then the last thing I got to say on this topic is, I love that you're like, it's your own trigger. It's your own boundaries because boundaries equal freedom. And I continue to learn that, right? And I don't like to say no to anyone. That's a problem. And mm -hmm. um, there's a element and a, we really are good. I feel like I'm getting global right now, but there's an undercurrent of workaholism that is in the world right now because we all were relegated to our homes to do work. A lot of people lost their big corporate jobs for various reasons and started to do, to do entrepreneurial things. So more and more am I seeing this cadence of people being like, I put the kids to bed and have dinner and that's a couple hours and then they go back to work from seven or eight o'clock at night or whatever it is till midnight. And then the next day it's 6 a.m. And then it's, there is a, a culture, especially, I mean, a lot of this is US of A, but also globally, there's a culture of this like workaholism, which if you look at cultures with longevity in the world, if you look at, especially like Norway, Sweden, Finland, like they're making sure they're getting outside, even if it's some work related and they're taking breaks. If you look at Spanish culture or like the siesta culture, there is some, some correlation there to people actually being a bit more joyful in general, you know? And that's, it's just something I can't address it for the whole world, but it's something we need to continue to think about is how do we put the pencil down and recognize that just because we're not doing the doing, welcome to the world of masculinity, and I don't mean men, that energy, specifically the doing energy is so, has been so strong for a hundred years and there's a space right now, even for men, and hopefully we're all feeling this, males, females, non-binary, everyone, there's a space for feminine energy. There's a space for the being energy. And the being energy is like the water bearer. It's just like holding the space and sitting with it. And this stillness you just talked about, Danielle, which is such an important thing. Like you and I should hold a stillness circle once a month. It would make me feel better. It'd be like 20 minutes. Let's we all it. get online and nobody <laughs> says anything, but we're sitting together. Because stillness is really hard for us right now. It's so hard. So hard like, for me. Including, including me, including you have to sit with ourselves too. I say this a lot to clients. Like you got to know how you like your eggs. It came from some like 80s teeny bopper film or something. But like, how do you like your eggs, right? Do you want them fried over easy poach? Like you got to know your innate inner self and what that self in this moment, because we're allowed to change every day in this moment, wants and needs and is turned on by and is inspired by and keeps your clock ticking and joy in your life that's hard that like i don't like to use that word and i use that word too much but that's challenging that's that's the that's the game of life right and then then i think when we sit back and we can be a little more creative in peace or stillness or space or meditation or i don't care if you're coloring or you know those mandala coloring books that you can do with your kids now like whatever you're, you're doing things with your family and friends that are a bit more recreational or a bit more space holding, a bit more in stillness. And it actually fosters more creativity. And I really believe you can balance them to get more shit done happily every day. And that's like, I don't, I'm not perfect at that game, but I'm going to keep navigating and working really hard in the biohacking space with either the tech or the old school ancient practices to try to find more answers and gosh, I hope I want that. I want, that's the mirror of truth. I want to hold up to everyone, you know, that that's out in the world. I, I love it. And I love where this conversation <laughs> has gone because it's not where I thought it was going to, but I think it's what we, we both needed and what everyone might be needing right now, because this is just such an important conversation. And it's, 
I love how you talked about needing that coach and needing that external accountability sometimes because there is just there are those things that we are going to avoid because they're there we perceive them to be hard or uncomfortable or like it's it's not really worth it it doesn't really matter like oh it doesn't matter if I skip this right like it doesn't matter if I skip one day of doing my breath work nothing it doesn't matter on like a very grand scheme but having that connection, the accountability, your why, like this dialed into your lifestyle, that's where you're going to get that accumulation of all those small little changes that you're doing. And then they accumulate to become something really big. It becomes who you are, it becomes your lifestyle and partners, as you mentioned, wives, spouses, horrible accountability coaches. They just, (laughs) they, it's a known thing. Like you cannot, my wife is a mobility specialist and I am horrible at remembering to do my, my mobility work. And she gets so upset with me and she's like, you know, that your joints always hurt. And I, she, I'm not a good accountability partner for her to remember her supplements and dial in her blood sugar. It's like, we have to do our own thing. And like, you know, get other people to help because it is, it is challenging. So we need that external and that's why coaching programs are so successful and why coaches need coaches because we all have those, those areas. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And that five minutes, like the, the, let's just say it's breath work or meditation or the five minutes of stillness or the walk around the block or the putting your feet in the sand or the grass. What happens if the one day that you're like, it doesn't matter, I can skip today is the day where the big idea comes, right? What happens if you skip the day where the million dollar idea comes or the, hey, I figured out how to like buy the house or make the baby or do the, do the, the magic trick that's going to like get every one of the 10 women in my circle that I'm working with like in optimal wellness, like whatever. What happens if that's the day you skip? Then you're like, oh, damn. You know what I mean? And you don't know what you don't know, but like, don't skip the day of the thing or the, the opportunity to sort of be able to provide more. And like, we're so busy, busy that we, if we don't stop, the ideas don't come. It's so crazy. Yeah. I love yeah. that. And I feel so, so proud of myself because I did something that I've never done before. And I booked a trip a solo trip. I'm going to the mountains of North Carolina. I booked an Airbnb so I can be sitting out on the patio and just being to myself and I'm allowing space. I'm not going to be like answering work emails or anything, but I'm allowing my myself space for if there comes any like creativity. And usually once my mind quiets, then I get, I call them all these downloads from the universe for programs or how I'm going to do certain things in my business, but like big ideas and things Mm -hmm. that are like, you know, just those great ideas, like you were talking about. And so I'm just giving myself that space to do whatever. (laughs) So I'm really, really excited about that. Yeah. That's so juicy. That's so great. And this is the thing, right? This is the like, how do we honor? And this kind of even leads into like what a lot of biohacking is for me. How do we do, it's like take leap in the net will appear or how do we get comfortable with really living in discomfort, especially what we just went through was living in discomfort. And so we all hopefully have learned that we have more capacity, even if it, even if we fell off our rails a little bit, because it was like an unprecedented event in the world, we can see that we can thrive and survive we can even you know be comfortable being uncomfortable for long periods of time so how do we like titrate that discomfort so we get really really good at it like one of my old um strength training coaches used to always talk about if we wait you know logan what's up at out in deuce gym in la but he always says like if we wait for the divorce or the you know um uh, diagnosis diagnosis diabetes we wait for the 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 house to burn down. We wait for the thing that is going to be the trauma to arise. And that's the only time we actually address being comfortable in that discomfort. Like how good are we really going to be at it? But if we go seek out the types of things that are scary to us on a microcosm, meaning like, Oh, I'm going to go get under a barbell and I never did that. Or I'm going to go, you know, to this retreat Airbnb for a few days, which is exciting and probably feels really like titillating and great and amazing, but there might be a part of you too. That's like scary. (laughs) Well, I'm sitting with myself, like really like, and, and you have to get into that rhythm and into that flow. Right. And then you really get to discover yourself too. So if we get, if we go and seek those things out, right. And they don't even have to cost a lot of money. If we go seek those things out, this is like the ice bath or the cold shower, whatever, 
then we can like practice at living in stress and practice at saying, actually, I'm pretty badass and I just handle that, you know, it's type two fun. It's like fun after you've done it once and you're like, Ooh, okay, that was a <laughs> that was not so bad. <laughs> yes, I love that. So talk to us more about um, this concept of putting ourselves under a little bit of stress when it's like, wait, aren't we stressed all the time? Like, let's talk, let's sort of unravel that. Like why we would want to purposefully stress our bodies. Yeah. Um, so like the, the nerdy science world, world would call it hormesis, like a hormetic stressor. Word. And um, we have like two types of stress we can have, uh, use stress and distress. And use stress is sort of like the supplied minimum effective dose of stress that actually levels up our body. And it may be that it's um, improving our overall um, sensitivity to glucose. It may be that it's leveling up our cellular health, that it's boosting brown adipose tissue. If you're talking about ice, it's getting us some more tolerance to carbon dioxide, which is a nerdy way of just saying, learning how to breathe better and oxygenating our tissues in a way that is um, better than we normally do, uh, or including if we're doing sports performance. We are, this is the same reason that we might take um, you know, something in small amounts that our, our body needs to get used to or absorb. Like it's just creating small stressors that the body can adapt to and level up over time so that we can improve our overall well being. A lot, you hear about this a lot in the longevity space. Um, and to really take it all the way back down to like an easy, you know, um, story, if you will, it's just like we go to the gym, we lift a heavier weight than normal by five pounds. We do this thing, which is like micro tearing our muscles, which always sounds like, Oh my God, but it's like, it's a very, very micro tear. And that's like, we're creating hypertrophy. We're building muscle strength because as that muscle fiber, muscle protein synthesis occurs, the muscle fiber repairs, and then we can get stronger. Our body goes, Oh, Danny wasn't kidding around with that sprint work or that extra five pounds. We better level up everything so that next time we know she means business. She keeps coming to do this and putting on more weight. We're going to get stronger overall so that we can manage that new stressor. And our body is this incredible thing that adapts. And this is what this is about is overall adaptation. And so many ways we can do that, right? So many ways we can play with that and actually make it feel fun, including like going out into the sunshine without wearing sunblock for not too long and not at noon or whatever, but like, oh, okay. Just it's, ad it's adapting the body to be able to handle all of these things better. Right, so that's, really well said. I love the term hormesis. Um, and I like that idea of we're exposing our body to little bits of stress so that it can adapt and get stronger. So that's much different from every single day. My boss is stressing me out and I'm sitting at my desk just stewing about it because all that stress, it doesn't have anywhere to go, you know? And yeah. so it, we're just, we're not doing anything and it's this chronic, low level stress. And I have a feeling if your boss is stressing you out, that's probably not the only thing in your life that's causing you stress, you know, yeah. sitting at, sitting at a job all day, sitting at a desk all day under fluorescent lights, you know, not getting outside, not doing these things and, you know, relationship, there's so many chronic stressors that we have that we're exposed to. So these little doses of more acute stressors will allow the body to adapt and get stronger. And of course you have to sort of have that in acro yoga, we called it accurate self um, awareness where, you know, it's like, I'm not going to go in an ice bath for three minutes when I just, you know, lost my dog and was, you know, got let go of my job and I have all this chronic stress, maybe that's not the best place to start. Right. So, yeah. because that might be too much. So, um, we've been sort of alluding to the ice. So why don't you tell us a little bit about cold exposure, some of the benefits and why someone would want to ever sit in a bath of ice. <laughs> <laughs> I was always like, why do you want to do this? How do you want to do this? Um, so there is, there are, there are a number of reasons why we would get in the ice. I think what's really interesting about cold and let me just like preface the whole thing by saying sometimes it's called, you know, it could be a cold shower or cryotherapy or ice baths, but typically in the literature, ice baths are the thing that is the most course correcting for the body. Um, if we're talking about ice baths, it's important to say, I'm not a medical doctor. Um, I only play one on TV. And if you are like newly pregnant or have a, a diabetes diagnosis and you want to talk to your doctor about doing it before you do all these things 
That being said, I've seen success with anecdotally and with um, clients and in some of the literature about people with various different dis-ease states that are maybe not even advised by their doctor to go in and do things. And they are actually course correcting or at least titrating or getting rid of symptoms, right? I'm never going to use the word cure, but um, for me, cold exposure, deliberate cold exposure, sometimes called ice swimming or cold water immersion, ice plunging, um, the polar bear club, whatever, those things are, that practice is one of the most profoundly transformative practices I have ever worked with. And I work in a landscape, a lot of different biohacks, um, breath and cold together there that you can't sort of undo those two things because your nervous system and your breath are connected. And when you get in the cold, trust me, your nervous system is like, yo, we are here. And so, <laughs> but um, managing your breath, understanding your physiology and getting in cold water for a short minimum effective dose of time is one of the most profound transform, profoundly transformational practices I've ever done and coached in my life. It is why it is a big passion piece of my business and why I share a lot and why I have this Sherpa breath and cold instructor training and why I incorporate it into all my programs at Warrior Woman Mode. And with every athlete I work with, I make sure there's a breath and cold component. Um, once in a while, I get a client, I have a client who like lives in Alaska, who's like, I am not like ice bath, whatever. My entire life is cold. <laughs> so once in a while I get resistance and certainly people are autonomously allowed to say no, but um, this practice of deliberate cold exposure has so many benefits, which we can talk about um, from like, you know, helping you work with blood sugar reg regulation, helping you with capacity, like understanding. People will be like, I am not doing that. That's hard. I can't do two minutes. A lot of like, you know, self deprecating thought processes or anticipation that crushes someone before they go in and then they go in and they do it. And it's like, it's like you just jumped out of an airplane. I don't know if you've ever jumped out of a plane, but when you jump out of a plane and you watch other people like land from jumping out of a plane, they get off and they're like, they're like this, this face, like, I don't even know, like they were just born again. Like they just had the best sex of their lives. Like they're just like off the plane being like, I did the thing that I didn't think I could do. Right. That was hard. That was scary. That was, and so it ice in three minutes is this microcosm of two things. Number one is a coach. I get to see somebody's entire life, even sometimes now that sounds a little hippy dippy, but like someone's entire way they process any stress that hits them. I get to see that in this microcosm of it might even be 90 seconds out of the three minutes, the first time, because you get into stress and it is a, a, an exact replication of what you do over a longer period of time, maybe under other stressors, because it's so intense in the cold. And so I get to see that microcosm of how people handle stress instantly. And also people start to see their own ways of handling stress. And then they learn how to breathe and they learn how to do it. And then they get out after maybe two or three minutes or whatever it might be. And they're like, oh my goodness, I saw my stress. I see my capacity. I am stronger than I thought I was. And I can do this differently and better. And that to me, in a th when else, in what other practice in life, not many, do you get under five minutes that kind of state shift from somebody, that kind of mental mindset shift, that kind of capacity shift, um, and that kind of like overcoming a fear. It just, it's so, it's so beautiful. That's I'm awesome. a nerd about it. You can tell. <laughs> I, no, I, I, well, I consider myself a nerd about a lot of things. And I like when people are a nerd about things and I'm putting that in air quotes because <laughs> it's just showing that you're passionate about it. And there's probably a really good reason for that. And so I love when people are super passionate about something because I, there's probably a great reason. And it, just like you said, that sort of transformation and overcoming this huge obstacle that you don't think that you could do. I've done a few cold plunges in my time. Um, yeah. They weren't full on ice because I got a bunch of ice, but it's Florida. And so it wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't cold enough. Like I didn't get like eight bags of ice. I mean, maybe I got like two or three. So it was comparatively, I mean, it felt really, 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 really cold because my body is acclimated to really hot temperatures. So I, you know, it definitely did, it, it had effects. So what are some of the physio like physiological effects from being exposed to cold and how does one yeah. go about doing it? 
Yeah, for sure. So physiologically, we'll see the, the, the one interesting thing about cold. I mean, Huberman continues, Andrew Huberman continues to popularize cold and um, more and more you're, we're seeing, you know, Lady Gaga go on the ice and it's, it's Wim Hof, of course, you know, those people are out in the world talking about immunity boosting. There are immunity boosting benefits to going into the cold because we are giving ourselves a little bit of stress so that as we continue to have to fight things in the world and in our in our body's terrain that come in through the environment and through weather and all of that. Um, we see that. But the one thing to note about the literature is there is plenty of literature with proof points that this is beneficial. The literature is also all over the place. So not enough women in the literature. And when I say literature, I just mean the research. So like not enough women are showcased in there. There's sometimes it's like one arm in cold water before I did a training session at the gym. And sometimes it's a cold shower. Sometimes it's cryo. Sometimes it's up to our neck in, in ice cubes, or maybe it's ice swimming. And as you can imagine, the temperature difference and the, you know, there's so many differentials and variables in that, that it's like hard to say this exact thing and this exact temp and this exact time, because that's the question everyone asks. Um, there are some answers to that. We, we can talk about those next, but just physiologically things that we see are um, increased in immune system function. We see um, the biggest thing is, you know, Many times women who are coming to me looking for body recompositioning or i.e. fat loss are like, I'm never going in the ice until they hear the one sentence that's like barely out of my mouth before they're like in the water, which is it boosts brown adipose tissue. Now we have a couple types of fat in the body. We have a few, but the, to simplify it, white fat is what we want to get rid of. Brown fat is something we had as a baby. It's densely rich in mitochondria. It has a lot of more faster metabolic function. And it's just better for the body and it helps transform or burn off that white fat. And so we boost brown adipose tissue. We used to think that at the age of 20, we would have no more, but we found that strong temperature changes can create more brown adipose tissue, which then burns fat faster. And I will say that not just anecdotally, but what we see is there is a very strong correlation. And I have never been personally with, with my own body and some of my clients' bodies um, have seen never seen recomposition work as fast as the cold creates, meaning it is shifting based on your shiver response, based on frequency of going in the cold. Cause you know, one ice bath will help you and clarity and mental acuity and all that, but multiple ones will change the game at a cellular level. That is like 10 X versus cold showers and cryo. Now I'm not knocking a cold shower. Sometimes that's the only thing we have access to. Short-term effects of the cryo and the cold shower world, you know, will help with sleep, will help with delayed onset muscle soreness, pain, definitely mood boosting. So if you're feeling low or stressed post-quarantine, if you're feeling like you're having a rough time right now, like a one to three minute cold shower, stay in as long as you can, get it on your face. Don't cheat the system and just stand far away from the, the faucet. That can really help mood boost you when you get out of the shower, you have a norepinephrine hit. If you have other people with you, you get oxytocin, like get everyone in the cold shower. <laughs> but, um, but in the ice specifically, we are, we're, we're boosting a lot of parts of our cellular system. We're upregulating um, our cellular health in general. We are um, dropping these bliss chemicals. As we go in the water, we have a norepinephrine or adrenaline hit. We come out, we get oxytocin and a parasympathetic nervous system rebound. We do a big system flush because all of the blood in your body will be shunted to the middle of your trunk. And that's to protect the organs, right? That's to keep everything really warm. So sometimes people have this really normal occurrence, which is a little tingly fingers or toes when they get in the ice bath. And that's because a large percentage of the blood is going to protect your organs and your brain, your heart, your lungs, and all the things it knows, right? In case you were to stay in there for longer, but you're doing this deliberately. So you're not, you know, hopefully overdoing it. And that sends some detox signals to the body as well. So I think those are the biggest, you know, that plus what we talked about with capacity and hey, uh, like mindset or like, wow, I have some grit that I didn't even know about. Those are the, the, the pieces of it, I think are most physiologically interesting to me. And yeah, yeah that really can like, let's, you know, not cure, but like fight off and mitigate a ton of things. I mean, I have people in the 11th, uh, their 11th hour of dealing with like autoimmune conditions, which are rampant right now with um, sugar issues, again, like diabetics, you have to be careful depending on how severe your case is and all of that. But just even if we're working to 
fluctuate and grow better insulin sensitivity. There's colds that we can use to be able to do that in our system. Um, it boosts met metabolism overall, right? Like for about 24 hours afterwards, your metabolism's on fire about 300% more than it was when you first got in. I mean, there's just so many beautiful benefits to cold water immersion. Um, yeah, and you gotta start where you got, where, where you have to start, meet yourself where you're at, right? I think, did you see the Rogan? Ep I always talk about him and one day it's gonna get back to him and I love him, so it's great. But the Rogan episode where he like got in his cold bath for like 20 minutes on live, Instagram live. 20? Yeah. And so it was like, so cute. Like, I love this because it's like, you know, one first day he does one minute. Um, this also gives you some sensibility sometimes in sort of like, the neurobiology maybe of, of the male psyche, but he does like one minute in the cold plunge the first day on Instagram live or yeah, live, I'm sure it was. And then he posts it. And then of course, like Jocko Willink and David Goggins, you know who these guys are, they're kind of like fit MMA, Marine Corps, like that, like go hard, right? Like, ooh rah, ooh rah guys, like his friends are like, oh, you only did one minute. You know, they gave him shit. And then he's like the next day or the day after, what up, what have you? He's like, fine, I'm gonna go in. He goes in for 20 minutes and it's live, the whole thing. And he starts in the beginning and he's like, you know, this is a big, strong man. And you know, Joe Rogan, like he's, he's, yeah. he's got his shit together. And so I, I think it's like he muscled through it, right? Which is a different context than maybe we're trying to do. Um, and he did 20 minutes and by the end he is, feverishly shaking in the water and still he did it and he got out and he survived and it's all fine but I, I I want to say to anyone who's out there because he's got you know four million views if you saw that it doesn't have to be that way you don't have to do Joe Rogan 20 minutes it's not you know I would even argue that for him it's a point of diminishing returns at that point versus minimum effective dose right you're like sub pre hypothermic or something. And I also like, look, he could call me tomorrow and be like, let's ice bath next to each other minute for minute and I'll kick your ass. And I would like take him on that challenge, you know, but safely, like with somebody there to make sure I was okay. Um, but I don't want people to be scared off by that like 20 minute ice bath. That's not the jam. The jam is we can kind of see from the research, which comes from a number of places. And then there's a woman named Susan Soderberg who did a lot, she's a researcher herself and does a lot around ice and sauna. She says the sweet spot is around 11 minutes over the course of a week. So meaning not in one, not in one plunge, but you know, going two or three times over the course of the week, maybe going two to four minutes a piece, depending on what feels right. When I started, I was like, I'm gonna do six minutes a day, but I wasn't doing the first day, six minutes straight in the ice. I did, you have to build up to that. And so um, I like to tell people you need at least 90 seconds because you gotta really feel it. And the first 30 is when your body's just faking you out to try to talk you out of doing it. And you need to breathe through that moment to really understand your body will course correct and it does get easier. No one believes me until like 90 seconds in where they're like, I'm like, you know, maybe I'm like with Molly, Molly, our mutual friend, Molly McLaughlin. I was like, put my hands gently on her shoulders and was like, <laughs> I whispered in her ear, you're not going anywhere. And she was like, ah. <laughs> but like after 90 seconds, Molly's system is like, oh, okay. We regulate, shunt, shunt blood, acclimatize. Okay. And then it's like, oh, I'm fine. And then she can do three minutes, no problem, or even more. And so we need to apply. It definitely got easier. It yeah. definitely got easier. The beginning yeah. is the hardest. Yeah. And like you said, the body is trying to adapt to be like, okay, she's not getting out. So I gotta, <laughs> I have to adapt somehow and save myself. And then, yeah, it gets a lot easier. I was interested in that parasympathetic rebound because when I was doing this over the winter, I was noticing I, my adrenals were kind of um, a little bit struggling at that time. And I thought that afterwards I had to like lay down and take a rest or a nap or something afterwards. So I just thought that it was too much for my body at that time, but maybe it wasn't. So can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, for sure. Um, an important thing to talk about is like differences between physiological males and females. There are some when it comes to cold plunging that we've seen. And the one thing I'm a little bit conservative on is I don't think women need to go in every day. And men seem to tolerate everyday ice plunging better than, you know, fem physiological females. That being said, for everyone, like, unless you have an ice 
lake outside the back of your house. Like it's too hard to go in every single day. It's too much. It's a lot of work unless you're like, I have an ice bath at my house, but I still won't go in every day because uh, if you have any kind of dysregulation in your hormone profile, what I see is a continuation of that dysregulation. If you do it every day as a woman. And I did like two tests over 34 days of six minutes straight, more or less every day. I did six minutes every day. In the beginning, I broke it up. And then I, and I, my period came nine days early. Look, I know this is an experiment of one also, Mm -hmm. but my period came nine days early. My hormonal profile kind of fell off a cliff and uh, I'm not 25 years old. And uh, there's a hundred other reasons that that those things could have happened when that happened. But as soon as I stopped doing that, things tended to be, things we re-regulated. So I say to women, Hey, every other day, three days a week. Awesome. That's like what, that's a great dosage. Um, and I think just starting with like a two to three minute or like as your goal saying, and if you do it in, in partnership or with friends, it makes it a little easier. If you get an Instagram photo out of it and you can burn 15 or 20 seconds with Insta courage, we say, you know, there's all these different ways to play the ice bath, but, um, you know, getting in, setting yourself up for success, sub 40 degrees Fahrenheit, which is like, let's say five degrees Celsius or less. I think it's actually like three or four degrees Celsius or less. And just really experiencing the cold, exploring what that feels like and measuring, you know, measuring and understanding that you can use your breath to reverse engineer the nervous system. What you're talking about specifically with this parasympathetic rebound is the cool piece and is why when I first started ice plunging years ago, I thought I'm going to love it in the morning because it will wake me up and set me positive into my day. And I, I do, I like it at sunrise. I like it in the morning but not as much as I like it at sunset. My prime favorite time to do cold plunging is three to five hours before bed. It sort of sets you up for success for sleep, especially if it's two or three hours before, because you have a a nervous system response when you get in cold, right? You're like, fuck, that's cold. (laughs) And then, (laughs) hi mom. And then you get out and you're like, nervous system is like, we're surviving. And it gives you this huge hit of bliss chemicals. And you've got already got adrenaline, norepinephrine, same thing, but like in your system and you've already got, um, your body feels like it's saved. And I've had big corporate executives on the rooftop of my LA house when I lived there that I was like, oh, these are the most stoic people I've ever met that are like singing Disney show tunes, you know, after they get out, like you just get to see this childlike um, bliss chemical response in the body. And it is actually like your nervous system doing a, a reset. It's your parasympathetic system being like, oh, we can rest, we can digest. We got through that. We triumphed through that really scary, big sympathetic moment, that that fight or flight moment. We learned to breathe through it. We survived and it's celebrating that. And then part of that is it's like, oh, now we can totally relax and rest. And it really, my sleep scores on the nights that I plunge are amazing. I get more deep sleep. I tend to have a little bit better HRV score. It depends on if I worked out. Sometimes that HRV score is like, I'm still in recovery, but it's a beautiful practice for that time of day. And so that parasympathetic rebound and you getting tired and sleepy is not necessarily a response of your adrenals. I mean, the the best literature that just came out for, especially for women, um, to hear that was, uh, Huberman just talked about on his podcast recently, which is that ice baths, it looks like ice baths in all of the research are not spiking cortisol. All these other systemic things happen, but you don't have a cortisol response. And so that I was like, I, I, you know, halfway in that podcast and I'm already in the ice bath because I'm always watching my cortisol because the way I'm pretty alpha and I'm pretty intense. And so I have to manage that a lot. And so when I heard that, I was like, this is great. I'm like trying to keep my cortisol down to a to a minimum. And now I don't have to worry about it so much. And I was like, of course it doesn't have a cortisol spike. It's all my practice. Amazing. So that's that's like cool to know, you know, it's cool to kind of hit that. Yeah. Really, really cool to know. So you talked about doing breath work, pairing the two, how they're so powerful. So, and I've heard of Wim Hof, but I'm not familiar with the breath work that you do. So what type of breath work are you doing in the ice and how does it help? Yeah, there's a lot of different ways to slice that. Um, Wim Hof style breathing as an oversimplification and Wim is so amazing. He's such a sweet guy. He really like raised the bar and popularized this practice of cold exposure. He, a lot of, he has a vast difference of, of breathwork styles and trainings and teachings, but the one that he does a lot in the cold is um, his instructors tend to meet sympathetic with sympathetic. So setting your system up with a sympathetic breathing style so that when you get in the ice, you're already at that sympathetic nervous system state. 
which works yeah. like it can work and and coming off the years we just came off and working with a lot of high powered executive women and athletes that are over maladaptively training or overstressed or overworked or crushing it or going hard i like to reverse that i like to set people up with a down regulated breath calming their nervous system state so they can match when they are getting in the cold. Yes, you're going to have an initial nervous system response, a sympathetic response. But if you just breathe for a while, could be as short as a couple minutes in a downregulated state. Trust me, when you get in the cold, you forget everything else except for what you just did. And then you put your you match your breathing pattern to what you did just moments before, which is a calm, long, easy let's just call it 2x breathing, breathe in for four and out for eight. So you're really long exhales. Then you can meet the cold with ease and with grace. And you're really doing the thing that I think is most important, which is surrendering into the cold. That doesn't mean you're giving up. It means you are learning the lesson and you are understanding what it's like to not hold tension in your body, to not muscle through the ice, which is just another way that we can address stress in the world, right? is something happens, the baby cries, the guy yells at you, your boss is pissed and you yell back and you fight back and you scream and holler. And it's just, none of that is good for your health. And so I wanna teach people when stress hits how to do the thing, which is downregulate their system and calm their system. And that correlates directly. Like we reverse engineer the nervous system by using the breath. A lot of times nasal breathing. I know people are talking a lot about nasal breathing. There's a time and a place and it's great to do 80% of your life. Sometimes, you know, nasal breathing isn't the answer, but nasal breathing and calming our state and calming our system so that when you and I are in traffic, like I would be in traffic in LA and I'm like about to pull my hair out that I know I can do a little breathwork protocol the same way I do it in the ice. And I'm calming my nervous system and literally changing my mindset because our nervous system is the trigger for that. It's a remote control to our entire, entire body's function. So that's how I like to coach people in the ice. And when I'm training instructors, I'm not teaching them the Kristen Weitzel method. I'm like, yo, here's all the colors. Here's all the palettes. We are certainly not the first people in the last hundred years. Like there's thousands of years of people breathing and ice plunging, using saunas, all of it. And so I'm like, here's a palette. You got your whole box of Crayolas. Let's do the smart thing, which is what is the context we're utilizing breath and cold for? Like, why are we choosing to use it in what variable? Are we training for an MMA fight? Are we gonna do a triathlon? Are we um, leading a transformational emotional release class? And let's pick the colors that we wanna use of breath and of cold to be able to shift people's state in the context and like know, know your audience, right? Which is the one thing in my opinion that gets left out a lot of breathwork training. It's like the know your audience piece. So we're healing people. We're not like giving them the wrong tools for the thing that they don't have. Gotcha. That makes total yeah. sense to me. And thanks for explaining the, the different options there. When I went in the ice, I did the um, shorter inhales and just really long mm -hmm. exhales to try to calm my body. And I can see how that could be really representative and a good practice for learning to calm your body when that then down when everything when else happens, happens. Yeah. when everything else happens. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a good yeah. practice. Um, so there's so many other types of biohacks, but I know you also do a lot with red light therapy and selfishly, I would like to learn more about red light therapy. So I'd love yeah. to ask you if you could talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, for sure. Um, there's, there's, Red light therapy is under the umbrella of photobiomodulation and photobiomodulation is like a fancy way of just saying like the study of wavelengths of different types of light. And that could mean colors as well. Like we can differentiate by colors. Some of the spectrum is visible and some of it is not. So that's why sometimes you have a red light panel that might be on and you're like, I don't really, it doesn't, is it on? It's like near infrared. You can't see it. Um, and that's sort of like funny, right? Like it's just, you know, we're all learning about these things. And the wavelengths of light in the red light spectrum, we've known about for lots of years. It was like in the in the 50s, uh, a guy named Niall Stinson was like using a ruby laser. And then we used to, after that, at some point to kind of figure out, we were wheeling patients out of hospitals in the sunrise in the early morning hours, and they were like getting better and getting sunshine. And it wasn't just like, well, vitamin D. 
but it was the, these wavelengths of light that were like helping with circadian rhythm and helping heal the body and boosting mitochondrial function. So the body could, it's actually the body can heal itself better, right? That's what red light is, is providing. And so um, there's so many different kinds in the world. I don't know if you have, I have a panel, the light path LED panel I love. It's also pulsed. So it adds a little extra layer of fun for like skin for all the ladies out there or brain power. Um, I have a flex beam that I really love. That's like um, portable targeted red light therapy. So I can put it on my body and potentiate workouts or utilize it before I go to bed because it's really hard to get in bed with a panel. <laughs> and um, all of the pieces of red light, like there's wound healing and scar tissue reparation. There's um, the capacity for injury healing is a really big one. When people are dealing with big injuries. Um, skin is another one. Like I, I you know, I, I know we're all so much on the beautiful marketing college and train. I just, I have clients that show up sometimes that I'm like, you're spending how much a month on powdered collagen that you use. And I look, it can give you aminos and it can help your bones and joints. But if you think that you have, if you intake five scoops of collagen a day and it's going to make wrinkles never come, that's just wrong. It's just wrong. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so like, if you really want to work with, you know, let's call it beautifying the skin, if that's a, a, a uh, a hot topic with women lately, I think you're much better served to get like a, either a portable or a small red light panel or some kind of red light thing that is, a, I mean, if you can afford it and the whole family can share it, you're going to spend 11, $1,200 on a big panel, but then everyone can utilize it and you have it for years. These things are made so durably. And then it's great for skin. It's great for just getting you setting yourself up for the right energy and the right resources that your body needs. And it's, it's interesting because the wavelengths of light on most panels are near infrared and red. Whereas if we go into a sauna, let's just put that out there and it's far infrared, far infrared usually presents as heat. So those are like different, different things in the spectrum, right? What are we trying to do and accomplish? But the red light we're talking about are the types of, is the type of red light that is sitting in front of a panel. Also beautiful marketing online. I don't know if you ever see this on the websites. It's like a gorgeous woman on a sofa and then like 10 feet away, there's a panel. And I'm like, it's not doing anything. <laughs> it's not doing anything. You have to be all of the research, most of the research. I never want to say all, some doctor will get on here and be like, you're wrong. But yeah. um, most of the research, and I have like Sarah Turner, who's a good friend of mine, who's like the world's foremost researcher on photobiomodulation. She has a secret file that I have access to that has thousands of studies and summaries that a human being like me, who is not a research, can read and easily understand. And in rat trials and human trials and all these different trials, most of the research is a close proximity. You're within like a foot or less. And typically most panel companies and most people would say, you know, you want to be like four inches for flex beam and for a lot of the research, the, the it's millimeters away from the skin that's making it work. And so you can't be five feet away from your panel. It can, I turn on my light at night because it's like, I'll sit by it and then I'll go walk and do something and I'll come back. And like, I'm sure my house looks like a brothel. But it, other than that, if I'm not sitting at the panel, it's just a decoration, a very expensive decoration. <laughs> and so yeah. um, it's important and it's important for people to know, you know, I don't know what your listening audience is exactly like around red light, but it's important to know you can't, um, they can't see the purple light bulb that's like branding over my shoulder, but you can't just buy a red light bulb on Amazon and assume it's gonna give you red light wavelengths that are correct. You typically wanna get the right diodes and these companies are, are, are playing in the spectrum of like 600 to 1000, which is where we see a lot of healing properties and the nanometers of wavelengths of light. So nerdy, but it's really, it might, it's my, look, cold and breath, mostly free. Like I know ice can cost a little bit of money, but cold and breath, mostly free. If people are going to invest in their health, you know, and it's coaching is a big deal. And also I think investing in a red light panel, especially if you're in a family and it's like shared and aggregated over time, like getting a red light panel for your house is just, it's a low hanging fruit way. As long as you do the important thing, which is use it, not let it hang your clothes on it for, you know, the, the dry cleaner or whatever. Um, it's a really low hanging fruit piece, you know, and I think, especially with the population of people that I imagine are listening here, who are really concerned about blood sugar, <laughs> you know, it's like uh, you hear marketing on red light. That's like, here's 8,000 benefits. But the reality is this, when you boost your, your body's cellular level, your downstream effects of those cells functioning better and being more juicy, like a grape, less than a raisin, not like a raisin, 
and communicating to each other, it's going to be that everything will work better. And that includes your insulin pump. That includes, you know, I mean, the one that's inside you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not, you know, whatever. And so that, that to me is just like, it's a no brainer. Um, and I, I recognize that I'm also really, you know, grateful that I'm, I'm able to afford to have bought one and, and, you know, there's that too. Uh, big hack for that is if you're not ready to do that or it's not in your budget, get out in the morning, sunrise and sunset, like best you can looking at the horizon is the best place to do it. But you'll see, I'm not saying stare into the sun, just to be clear, <laughs> go out and stare in the sun, Kristen told me, but getting in the sunrise and getting those, those wavelengths at sunset, being around that type of light is super healing for your body. You, you, I know you know this. And then Molly always talks about this. It's like super resetting for your circadian rhythm and just totally changes your energy and your sleep every single day. Yeah, absolutely. And I like that you're giving those free examples too, because we need to harness the power of the earth. And we just get, you know, some people can get some, you know, panels. I have a, an infrared sauna. It was, you know, something I saved up for. It's right next to me. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's, there's benefits of that too. Um, you know, looking at that sauna and it's like 98 degrees outside. I'm like, oh, maybe I should just get outside, <laughs> you know? Um, but there's, there's so many different options and so many of these hacks, there's so many free options that we can do fasting, breath work, getting on the earth, looking at the sunrise. I mean, totally. getting, you know, a cold shower, like all of these things, we can do these things for free to very little cost. And so don't get hung up on, you know, all the tech and, you know, maybe that's what you want to ask for, for the holidays this year. <laughs> it's like a red light device or something. Um, and so, yeah, these are, these are awesome tools to help move the needle forward and kind of just sort of fill in the spaces to make that lifestyle a holistic, really healing lifestyle and sort of undo some of the damage that we come into because we are getting exposed to all sorts of crap all the time and chemicals. And, you know, we want our cells to be working better. And so these, these types of, you know, treatments and with whatever they're called, um, the biohacks, tools, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, biohacks. tools, biohacks, um, they're, they're just, they're tools that we can take out and utilize at different times to see, see what happens. So I'm excited. I'm going to go take a cold shower. <laughs> um, I need a little bit of an energy boost. I also need to eat, but, um, I need to, uh, you know, I'm going to do some of these hacks today and I'm really excited to start re put it because I usually fall off from that, you know, date with myself, that morning routine, because, you know, life gets in the way, but I'm inspired by you to put it back into my, my everyday be, as my non-negotiable. So thank yeah. you for inspiring Higher me there. Date. Higher <laughs> yes. self date, everyone, or whatever you want to call it. It's like, yeah, I love it. I'm not, I'm, I always say I'm woo adjacent or it's like a, a or that I'm like, welcome to the woo universe. But like, there are things in my life I want to put in to remind myself to be in my being of femininity. And, you know, I'm in Austin now. So we'd say goddess energy or whatever it is. But those things are like, it's important for us to understand what it feels like to breathe and sit back and experience allowing things to come to us. So a lot of us are like really, you know, putting things out in the world, like we're doing the doing. But if we sit and we breathe and we settle into ourselves and we get to know ourselves a bit better. I think things start to energetically, they are allowed into our, into our, you know, our mini atmosphere where we can see them and touch them and be like, wow, that's so lucky that that came to me, but it's actually not so lucky. It's just that you're beautifully tapped into your own energy and you're witnessing your life and you're doing some self-discovery and the right people and the right partnerships and the right, everything will continue to roll in the right healing tools, the right podcast for anyone who's listening to this for the first time, right? You got here somehow. So super cool. I love it. So yeah. tell people where they can find you, how they can work with you, um, all those things. And I'll put everything in the show notes. Yeah, cool. Uh, probably the easiest way is at warrior woman mode on Instagram. I have warriorwomanmode.com. I have wellpowerpodcast.com that you'll get a chance to hear Danny talk on all about glucose because everybody needs to continue to learn about that. It is like such a baseline to getting everything in your life, right? As you already know. Um, and then, yeah, I have a Sherpa breath and cold. I do experiences for 
corporate America. I do experiences for groups, SherpaBreathingCold.com. And everything kind of falls under the umbrella of the work that I'm doing with women and athletes. It's all there. It's like easy to find my online course. And I put a bunch of free tools out on the bottom of my website. I'm like, here's seven free biohacks, download it, get an email every day for seven days with a different hack. You could get, you can see me take a cold shower. It's ridiculous. I'm not naked. So gentlemen who are listening, <laughs> but you can see me take a cold shower in one of those emails, which is like a ridiculous video that I was like, am I really going to send this out? But it's just like, so you don't feel like you have to do it alone. You can like get in and then like watch the video on my iPhone. and <laughs> check out the I love it. I love that. So we'll link to all those in the show notes and I'm wanting to do a retreat at some point, like create one. So we'll have to maybe talk and see, you know, how that yeah. might fit in, but, um, or the, the stillness circle, there's <laughs> maybe some, <laughs> some things in our future that would be really fun collaborations, but thanks for coming on the show. And thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and taking us really deep today. Cause it was really helpful for me. And I'm sure a lot of other people really, really appreciated that message. Oh, I love you so much and the work you're doing in the world. Thanks for having me here. And uh, we're going to flip flop soon. So I get to ask you all the probing questions. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Can't wait. All right. Thank you.